Today is May 17th, 2012, and we are interviewing Donald Wayne Pagler. Pogler. Pogler. Always oh, sorry about that. Always get that wrong. At the Greater Long Beach chapter of the American Red Cross, Mr. Pogler is 66 years old, having been born on February 1st, 1946. My name is Mike Farrar, and I'll be doing the interview. Assisting me will be Carol Apt. This interview is being done for the Greater Long Beach chapter of the American Red Cross in conjunction with the Library of Congress and American Folklife Center. Mr. Pogler served in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War and achieved the rank of Second Class Petty Officer, E-5. First and foremost, Mr. Pegler, I want to thank you for your time and service to your country. Thank you. So tell me, Don, as a child growing up in uh, Wamego, Kansas, what was that like? Well, it's a small town, uh, 2,500. Uh, great place to grow up. Um, big world when you leave it. And, uh, <laughs> Um, my mother and father were born and grew up there, and my grandfather and grandmother, although I don't think they were born there, you know, obviously lived their lives there, so it was a long family history. Um, and, um, like I said, uh, it's a mile by a mile square town, so you could, I could run all over town, and, and, uh, and my uncles were farmers, and my grandfather was a farmer, so I did a lot of work on the farm. So it was uh, yeah. classic small town childhood, I'd say. Was your dad a farmer also? No, my well, my dad had grown up on the farm, and his father had a heart attack when he was young. His mother died uh, when he was fairly young. So at 16, he went to work as a welder oh. for a company uh, by the name of Balderson Incorporated, and they made attachments for Caterpillar Tractor Company equipment. They weren't owned by Caterpillar, but when a Caterpillar, uh, Caterpillar is like a car dealership, the Caterpillar doesn't sell its equipment to the ultimate customer. It has dealers that do that that are individually owned. And so when people would come in and they'd want something outside the normal piece of equipment you would hang on it, like say wood chips and things like that, uh, they, Caterpillar would refer him to Balderson's, and my dad, uh, as I said, started out as a welder. He ended up being vice president of manufacturing. Uh, he did most of the real engineering in the place, even though he only finished his freshman year in high school. Um, he um, had quite a math head on him, and so they would come in and say, you know, a customer wants this, and Dad would go out and design it and cut it out of cardboard, and then he would use the cardboard uh, to uh, get on the metal cutters and cut out all the metal pieces, weld them all together. And once he had proved that it had worked, he took his patterns into the engineering department and said, here, you guys make the drawings. Oh. So he was doing all the real engineering. And uh, so, uh, so I had... Uh, you know, two different backgrounds from that standpoint. And then my mother was in business all her life. So uh, I uh, really came from a background of two business people. Um, she owned a hardware store when I was young, which I worked in. Uh, it was about, I think Gamble's was like Western Auto or oh, yeah. Ace or any of those. And uh, later in life, when my dad retired, she became a real estate agent. And after he died and the guy she had been working for wanted to retire, she she ended up by having, getting her broker's license. And so at 89, she was still running her own real estate agency. Uh, sad to say, that was 2005, and she had some mini strokes. I, she called me up when, in the fall of 2004 and said, thought you ought to know that I blacked out and drove into a parked car on the way home. Well, it's a small town. She's probably going all the five miles an hour, so nothing was real. She wasn't hurt or anything like that, but it turns out that she had had some many strokes, and so the dementia started in 2005. Uh, I went back and lived with her for seven months, and we I um, uh, had to move her out of the house that we moved into in 1952 when I was six years old. Wow. And so that was quite an ordeal because... Uh, they had saved everything. I mean, every newspaper article from when I played football in high school, um, uh, 
you know, the, the, uh, I found my dad's ownership paper to his 1948 Studebaker in the basement. So, uh, so th that was a, a kind of a tough thing for me. But um, so, uh, and you mentioned before about how my mom and dad met. It turns out that my mother had gone put herself through Clark's Business College in Topeka, Kansas. And she came back to Omega and went to work for the man who owned this company, Balderson Incorporated. And so that's how they met. She was like the office manager. And so uh, I think my dad was 30 when they got married. So, Good. Any brothers or sisters? I have one sister. She lives in Los Altos, California. Younger or older? Older. Four older. years older. Oh, okay. So I'm the baby. <laughs> so any big... During this time in Kansas, uh, you experience any of the dust bowls they used to have back there? No, but tornadoes. Tornadoes. Yeah, yeah. I had a, uh, I had one uncle who, um, in the country, they usually lay out roads mile by mile, so they used to call that a, a block out in the country. So my aunt and uncle had heard that there was a tornado coming, so Ed said to Margaret. Let's go drive around the block. So that's four square miles. And they came back, and their whole farm was gone. Oh. <laughs> so, so, uh, but um, uh, summers were dry. But I, you know, uh, I did a lot of a lot of work out in the country. Like I said, I, uh, I carried an irrigation pipe for my uncle. And uh, my my grandfather, when I was in the seventh and eighth grade, uh, he had retired and was living on a small acreage, and so he and I grew three acres of sweet potatoes and watermelon. And when I was in the seventh and eighth grade, prior to that, I'd worked for my uncle. I, was, I think I probably started driving a tractor when I was seven years old, yeah. and uh, so uh, then after. In, in, in my sophomore year in high school, I went to work for a man who owned a dehydrating plant in Kansas. They grow a lot more alfalfa than they can actually use. So these dehydrating plants buy up the, the crops from the uh, farmers and go out and cut, cut it, bring it in, and turn it into pellets, you know, like dog food type pellets. And uh, so... I spent one summer, I think, working six days a week from six in the morning to six at night, driving uh, the cutting rig out in the field. So I learned to drive heavy equipment at a very young age, so that my last year in high school and my after my freshman year in college, I uh, worked for the state highway. And I think I drove every piece of equipment that the state had except for the D9 tractor. But I drove motor graders and loaders and trucks. And so. yeah. How was high school for you? Uh, I was an uh, excellent athlete and a poor student. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was uh, uh, football and track, although I did play basketball too. Football and track were my best events. I think uh, my junior year, I think I was a uh, league leading scorer. And my uh, senior year in track, I took second in the state of Kansas in the low hurdles. Uh, so I was blessed with a speedy body. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did not uh, do well in school. I'm good enough to get by, but that was about it. Uh, like my dad, I think math was my strong suit, but even at that, I, I never applied myself very much. <laughs> Uh, and that's how I ended up going in the Navy. I went to uh, college at a uh, Presbyterian men's college in Fulton, Missouri, at a high school. And after a year and a half, I flunked out of college. And I knew the uh, that in '66, I knew the draft would be breathing down my neck. So I went to Manhattan, Kansas, and uh, talked to the Navy recruiter. And he told me, he says, I've got just a ticket for you. He said, uh, there's a program. That the state of Kansas sends a company of recruits to Navy boot camp every other year. 
and called the Kansas company and he says, I'll put you on a 180 day de delay program and in June you'll go to boot camp with 80 other guys from the state of Kansas. And that's how I ended up in entering the Navy. So did you deliver, I mean, was the Navy where you wanted to go or did you get yeah, any, yeah, any my, other? My, no, my, my, uh, my uncle had been a communications officer in the Merchant Marines during World War II. He was on Liberty ships. And so I'd always wanted to go to sea. And I really wasn't the kind of person who wanted to be a Marine in Vietnam and pound the ground and shoot a gun. That wasn't really my objective, uh, but uh, uh, I, I'd always been drawn towards the Navy, yeah. Did you talk to your uncle in detail about going No, nah, you know, most of the older guys didn't talk a lot about yeah. their experiences, including my wife's uh, stepdad and her real dad, both were combat veterans and uh, they never talked till we got around me <laughs> and, and I grumbled so much about the liberty that they finally opened up about some of their own stuff so my yeah. uncle really never talked yeah. too much about uh, about his experiences. Did you talk to your dad, your mom and dad about before you went in? Uh, well they, had, they knew that my leaning towards uh, the Navy, how I felt about that and like I said the, the um, Back in those days, parents, I don't think, quite had the option of saying, no, son, I don't want you to go in the military because we had the draft. And so <laughs> you were, if the government got you, you were going to go. And yeah. so, uh, so uh, they knew once I wasn't making it. Uh, you asked me about uh, high school and what I was good. My, my uh, football coach, who I'm still in close contact with, uh, said when I got out of high school that he could get me a full scholarship to a small south, southeastern college in Kansas in both football and track, but I was at least aware enough of myself that I did, said to myself, I'm not going to take that because I know I won't make my grades and the coaches will be on me about not making my grades and I don't want to go through this guilt trip. So the way I ended up at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri was that uh, my aunt and my mother cooked up the scheme for me to go to school there thinking that, well, if he goes to a men's college and it's Presbyterian, that he'll, he'll get straightened out, you know, so to speak, and so, uh, which was a falsehood on their part. But, <laughs> but uh, so uh, all of those things, and, and like I said, though, you know, I, I see... The closest thing probably to the question you asked during our time, and it happened back in World War II, too, was that for the guys who wanted to join the service and were underage, not 18 yet, they would have to get their parents' permission. As a matter of fact, we had one guy that died during the attack on our ship, it was from Wichita, Kansas, and he had done that. He had joined at 17, and uh, the parents went through their trials with each other. The, the, the father wanted him to be able to go in, and the mother didn't. <laughs> and, and the two the two men family talked her into it. <laughs> and so uh, uh, that's probably the closest. Uh, it's not like society today. Yeah. So, so you you uh, sign up. Uh, where do you go to do your induction at? Well, because this was a political deal, and it was the Kansas company and everything, we went to. Uh, Fort Hayes uh, in Hayes, Kansas. Uh, we all were met there. We were inducted there, um, and then they put us on a train. Took the train to L.A. Uh, caught a bus from L.A. to San Diego boot camp, and uh, it's the rudest awakening you ever have when you hit boot camp. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. <laughs> well, uh, we got off the bus. And they had yellow footprints, and uh, they said, get on these yellow print, fruit, footprints, and you know, we've got guys with long hair, and, you know, <laughs> and uh, so they march us over to the chow hall, and we, it was like four o'clock in the afternoon, so we ate our supper, and we, uh, they brought us back, and uh, checked us into the barracks. I think we had to go pick up our own mattresses and stuff. Anyway, we get in this barracks and 80 guys who don't know how to put one foot in front of the other. And, and uh, the next thing I remember is the next morning some 
guy came in and flipped on the lights at 4 o'clock in the morning and said, All right, girls, you've got 20 minutes to shower and shave and get out on, on those footprints again. And you had to see 80 men trying to shave and get themselves collected <laughs> and get outside on some footprints at attention. So, um, and they, then they, uh, one of the other things I remember is they made us send everything home. I mean, deodorant, toothpaste, they did not let you keep one thing. Mm. And then uh, you got issued what they wanted you to have. And uh, so... Uh, Was this your first time away from home like that? Yeah, I had gone to college for a year and a half, so I had oh, been okay. out on my own, but not in a... You know, one of their speeches is, Mama's not here anymore to take care of you. You may as well forget it because you belong to us. <laughs> so, How was it sleeping in a barracks full of guys that snored and everything else? Any trouble sleeping? Nope. I don't remember, uh, you know, any issues with any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you, you line up the next morning, first morning actually of getting prepared for your boot camp. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, like I said, I mean, we didn't have a clue what was going right. on. And some people, uh, uh, two things uh, I think about the Kansas company, because it was the Vietnam era, you know, almost everybody in my boot camp company had at least a year and a half of college. So I was going through boot camp with relatively intelligent guys. And that was better than, you know, your average guy that came into the Navy got, period, got put in with the next 80 guys that came in. And, and so we had, I would say, you know, a smarter crew, you know. And so some, you know, some guys, when they, they just can't quite get it through their head that the only way to get through this is to <laughs> do the best job you can and do what you're told. Right. <laughs> and uh, if you're a rebel, you're going to make it harder on yourself, but you, you can also make it more difficult for your company. So we were... Uh, we were lucky in, in that respect, but um, uh, I don't, um, we, we still had people that, that just seemed to not get with the program. I mean, I go to, I go to places and I see people now, kids, people, whatever, and they just can't figure out how to get into a line, you know, and get the thing done. And I remember one time we were in, in uh, formed up to get shots. And back in my day, they were using an air gun to give you injections. So, uh, and this corpsman's up there giving everybody the speech. Don't move. Pay attention and do not move when we're going to give you the shot. And sure enough, somebody's in line up ahead of me, gabbing with somebody else, not listening. And he gets up there and he moves his arm when the corpsman gives him the shot and ripped his arm open. Uh, you know, some pe some people just take a little yeah. bit more, have to go through a little more pain to get the drift. <laughs> so, so you do boot camp? Yeah. First time shooting a rifle? Uh, no, no. I was I did a lot of hunting when I was a kid. Uh, okay. Quail hunting, duck hunting, uh, pheasant hunting. You qualify as expert? Oh no, we only we had I think one weekend where we went out and uh, and fired. Uh, Everything from M1s to this, some people got to shoot the Browning automatic rifle, but uh, but uh, in the Navy, that's not as big as we did that up at, at Pendleton, and uh, so they would bus us all the way up to Pendleton from the harbor in San Diego, and uh, they took us up there at another time for a week and put us through fire training, which relates to the liber the Liberty issue. Uh, and uh, the, that, the Navy puts more effort into things like that than shooting yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> and they had uh, these uh, things built, these floors, but they had little troughs around. And then they had walls. They weren't, it wasn't really an enclosed structure, but they had walls. And uh, they took you in there, and these troughs were filled with fuel oil. And then they would light them on fire. And boy, I mean, it, it gets the point across to you real quick. You know, that you better better know what you need to do when when this happens. Well, so it turns out on the Liberty, you know, we get put through our paces as far as that goes. So, um, my remembrances are that you know things like that. They put us in a gas chamber and, and threw tear gas on us. And so, I mean, there were 
you know, I mean, they had given us masks, but right. they, that's what they wanted you to do is, you know, make sure you knew what you were doing. And so uh, that's, uh, to me, that stands out in my mind more than the rifle training yeah. does. Yes, definitely. Uh, and tell me, Don, your, what was your MOS? Uh, I was called a crypto technician. Uh, and uh, it, the other services go by MOSs. As a matter of fact, if you look at a Navy uh, uh, Chevron, uh, anybody who is a third class petty officer or above, there will be an insignia uh, of what his job is. And the Navy's the only service that you can actually look at their, their insignia on their uniform and you know what, what they do. Uh, ours, mine happened to be a quill crossed with a lightning bolt. To give you an idea, if you were a radium, then it would be two lightning bolts crossed. Okay. If you were a yeoman uh, paper pusher, then it would be two quills crossed. And so when they developed our job uh, as crypto technicians, they made ours a quill crossed with a lightning bolt. Now, can you explain to us what a crypto technician does? <laughs> to some degree. I mean, when you go into the Naval Security Group, you sign up. You sign a piece of paper that says uh, $10,000 and 10 years in prison if you ever talk about your job. So, to some degree, I still don't ever talk about the details right. of my job. But basically, we were intelligence people. Um, and in crypto, there's various branches. There's our branch, which was what I was, which nowadays, if you get on the internet, well, in, in Navy, the Navy site, you, you, it, they'll call us collection people. So we were the actual people collecting intelligence. Uh, and branchers were the maintenance guys. They're the ones that maintained our equipment. Uh, oak branchers were the ones that sent the data back to NSA. Um, uh, T branchers was technical branch. And... Uh, I branchers were linguists, so they got sent to language school. Now, to get that kind of a job, though, did, when you had, did, you must have done pretty well on your uh, your ASVAB or, or. Yeah, when they sent it. They put us through a large battery of tests, and then you go for interviews. <laughs> this is a one of the stories that I always tell that I think is kind of something I certainly remember out of boot camp. Uh, I went for this interview in this first class that's down at the window where I am and starts going through my scores and stuff and he says, hmm, just a minute. And he walks away and comes back a little while later and he says, come with me. And so he walks me down this hall and opens up this door and inside this room there's a table with two chairs and a chief sitting in one of the chairs and that's all that's in this room. Typically start Navy atmosphere. <laughs> And so he says, go in here and talk to this guy. So I went in there, and the guy says, how would you like to be? Back in my day, they called us communications technician. They were being a little secretive about what we did. And so he says, how would you like to become a communications technician? And I said, gee, I don't know. What is it? And my brain's going 90 miles an hour, but I'm sure it beats swabbing dicks <laughs> for a living. So I... Uh, he, he, gave, he opened up a three-ring binder, and in the binder was one sleeve, and the sleeve had one piece of paper that had a paragraph about a third of the sheet of paper. And I was probably dumber after I read it than before I read it. That's how vague it was. And so he says, so how would you like to become a communications technician? And I said, well, I don't know. It sounds pretty good. Why, maybe... I'll put, maybe I'll put it down for my third choice because you got to put down three choices and I think I had put down ET electronics technician for my first choice and radio for my second choice which probably also influenced why they took me down the hall to talk to this guy um, and uh, the guy looks at me and he says son the only way you can get in the naval security group is if I recommend you and the only way I'm going to recommend you is if you put it down for your first choice so that's how I became a crypto technician <laughs> With one arm behind my back. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it was my choice, and like I said, it sure uh, it sure sounded a lot better than than swabbing decks for a living. So <laughs> yeah. So how how long was your training? Uh, so I went to boot camp from June to September '66. Then I went to uh, crypto school in Pensacola, Florida, from 
uh, September to March. Oh, okay. So it was six months. And uh, and then I got assigned to the Liberty. Uh, being assigned to the Liberty, is this your first time of being on a, a ship? Yep. Mm -hmm. And my first duty station of my, the kind of job I was going to be doing and uh, everything. So. so what were your expectations as far as being assigned to the ship? Um, after going through school, I had, you know, a roughly good idea of, you know, what the job was about, but is, is with anything, driving equipment or anything, actually doing it is different than right. learning it. So, so, uh, and, uh, I'm happy that the Navy did it this way, but when you're, when you're on ship, it doesn't make any difference what your job or is. I mean, we ended uh, our days off. We ended up chipping paint, and uh, swabbing decks just like every other enlisted guy did. So you didn't you didn't get out of something you, <laughs> just because you had a technical job. So. Did you know what your missions were going to be? Uh, yes and no. I mean, our normal run was up and down the west coast of Africa. Matter of fact, we left uh, Norfolk. On May 2nd, uh, I got on board late March. We left Mor Norfolk on May 2nd. We hit Abidjan the, later in the month of May, which is the capital of the Ivory Coast. Uh, and the normal tour of duty on the Liberty was 18 months, four months down in Africa, two months back in, in Norfolk. So you actually would make three cruises while you were assigned to the ship. Uh, in my particular case, we went to see May 2nd. We were shot up June the 8th, and in the end of June, I was home in Kansas on 30 days leave going, what happened to me? Yeah. But, um, and and be, what happened was uh, everything was heating up between the Arabs and the Israelis, so they had to decide who they were going to, how they were going to go collecting information for our government. And they, they decided to take us out of the out of the Atlantic, the west coast of Africa, and have us go into the Mediterranean. So we left uh, uh, Abidjan. We were supposed to have four and a half days liberty, and we were only there a day. And uh, they they rounded us all up, and we uh, left, and we went to Rota, Spain. Rota, Spain. We uh, picked up supplies and some extra crypto personnel. Um, and uh, then we eventually left Rota and went into the Mediterranean. And I think it was the fifth or sixth when we actually got on the station where we were supposed to be, which was uh, off the Gaza Strip, the uh, LRE, the, it's kind of the border between Air, uh, Israel and Egypt. Now, did you think it was a little strange that you picked up extra? crypto personnel for this trip? No, not really. Although I was so young, I didn't quite understand then what I understand now about all the ramifications. But uh, one of the guys we picked up, who even I have stopped to see back in Missouri, was a Marine sergeant. And he happened to be a linguist, Russian linguist. And so he had been flying uh, on planes, tracking uh, the Russian fleet in their maneuvers. And uh, he was on his way back to his home base in Bremerhaven, Germany. And he tell, always tells the story, a funny story, that uh, he said it was, I don't know, two or three in the morning, something like that. And all of a sudden, this sailor knocks at the door. And, and he, first he thought it was a bunch of drunken Marines out there partying, and finally, Guy kept knocking, so he got on. The, he went and opened up the door, and this young seaman apprentice show, gives him this piece of paper. Says, "You've got orders, Sarge." And he looked at the orders, and it, it was orders to go on the Liberty, but the orders were from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he looked at the sailor and said. Since when does this Joint Chiefs of Staff give a Marine Sergeant orders? <laughs> so, um, and then one of the people uh, that we picked up was a civilian who worked for the NSA. And uh, 
as a matter of fact, years later, I, his wife told me that she was sitting in a park across the street from the Army Navy Club in Washington, D.C., when she found out that he had been killed. So, um, so yeah, uh, you know, obviously we were going someplace that wasn't what we were normally outfitted for exactly, and so, you know, it probably isn't surprising that they they put extra extra people on there. So, so Don, tell me, you you pick up your these extra personnel, and and you're heading, you, you're finally to the border, basically of uh, of uh, Israel and and the and Egypt. Um, what's happening now? Well, we've gotten there, like I said, a day or two before, and uh, we were 13 miles off the coast, and we. Uh, I had worked the night before. The crypto guys, we worked eight-hour watches, as opposed to like ship's personnel usually work four-hour watches. And so uh, we had what was called an eve watch, a mid-watch, and a day watch. The eve watch was four to midnight. The mid-watch was from midnight to eight in the morning. And the day watch was eight to four. And so I had just come off the mid-watch that morning. And... I went to the Mestex, ate some breakfast, and our sleeping compartment was in the aft part of the ship. Uh, the crypto people slept in the aft part of the ship. The deck crew slept in the forward part of the ship. Part of that was because they didn't want people, even though you're not supposed to talk outside our, what we call our research spaces, just to avoid to make sure things didn't get set around people. They didn't want things set around. Uh, they divided the crew. Uh, into two different groups, which made it kind of difficult for the, our relationships with each other. And uh, but uh, so uh, my sleeping compartment was right after the mess deck. So after I got through eating, I just went through the hatch and got in my bed and uh, uh, rack in the navy and uh, went to sleep. And uh, the next step beyond that was. Uh, at one o'clock, I was rudely awakened by Captain McGonigal's general quarters drill. He had been running drills about every other day, I mean, he wanted to make sure we were prepared for whatever we were going to hit the sea. And so uh, we secured around 135 from the general quarters drill, and I went up on the uh, fantail with some other guys to smoke cigarettes and just relax since it wasn't on duty, and uh, I had decided to go back down into my compartment, uh, and I was halfway down the ladder from the main deck down into my sleeping compartment when the attack started at 2 o'clock. Now, right prior to that attack, was the ship anchored in? No, no, no. We were running about five knots. So you were still cruising? Yeah, yeah. We were, we were at sea and just slowly trolling along. And how many of these drills did the captain put you through before the actual... Well, like I said, I think he was running drills about every other day. Oh, okay, so... McGonigal was a stickler for drills anyway. He, uh... Which is a good thing, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we used to... It's one of the things we always talk about at reunions years later. We all bitched and moaned because... What's he get running, making us run all... We're not a combat ship. Why are we running all these drills, you know? And uh, turns out if he hadn't enough, we probably would, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> We'd have never kept that ship afloat. So amazing. So you're going, you're halfway down into your quarters, and you hear I hear metal hitting metal up, up top side and everything, and the general alarm, quarters alarm goes off again. So I, turns out that my my uh, general quarter station was on repair party three, and that happened to be on the mess deck. So I just went on down into my quarters, through the hatch, uh, onto the mess decks, and, uh, and uh, I was supposed to be in charge of a submergible pump. I was so green, they weren't going to give me anything, that, any job that was real crucial. And um, so I was supposed to be in charge of a submergible pump. So uh, I got in there. Well, uh, during an air attack, there's no need for a submergible pump. So uh, somebody grabbed me and said, uh, go topside and bring the wounded down from the bridge. So 
Um, I think I told you before that the Essence Lane Victory uh, down in San Pedro is the same hole as ours. Um, you could get to the bridge without having to go out on the main deck through the superstructure, and so that's what another guy and I did. We crawled up the ladders, and that's one of the few things I remember. I mean, after being traumatized, there's probably a lot of things that I don't remember, but is somebody threw up in a hatch when we got up near to the bridge and, said, and had a guy on a stretcher and said, here, take this guy below. So the other guy and I grabbed the stretcher and if, you had, if you've ever been on a Navy ship, ladders are steep. And so trying to keep these guys from sliding off of the stretcher by keeping them as level as you could uh, and waddling your way back down the to the mess decks, and so we had set up the hospital. Uh, the the uh, corpsman's station one was smaller anyway, and two had been damaged during the attack. So we set up uh, the hospital area on the uh, on the mess decks because the, all the tables were affixed to the floor, and so you know we had the badly wounded on the tables. Uh, it, it was a good place to have them. And so, uh, you want me? Well, uh, let me ask you uh, a couple of things. Um, when you first heard the general orders, when the attack started, did you, at first did you think it was another drill? No, because I, like I said, I could hear mm -hmm. metal hitting metal, and I knew that he was he McGonagall wouldn't have run another drill right after already. Having. What what was? If you can remember, what was going through your head when you, when you heard that? Nothing except that I knew I had to get to my general quarter station, and I went, I mean, you know, who, who would be attacking us? Right. And then, of course, we were attacked by unmarked planes, and so, um, you know, for a long time, most of us just assumed that it was probably Egypt that was yeah. attacking us. And when you go to general quarters, basically, that means that each sailor has a certain place to go to. Right. Um, and it must have been really hard going to a place where you knew that you weren't needed really at that time. Exactly, right? yeah. Because you probably wanted to go right to where the fighting was, to, to do whatever you could to help. Well, but, you know, we uh, all we had for armament was four fifty caliber machine guns. So uh, you weren't going to shoot down at jet fighters with a fifty caliber machine gun. And the guys that did get on... The gun mounts were ki immediately killed, and so. Uh, but yes, I didn't. You know, I, I was the thing I was thinking was, uh, there's no. What do, what do I do? I'm too green. I don't have a clue what to do, and uh, and I I knew that they weren't going to need a submergible pump. Yeah. And so that's why I said somebody was smart enough to say to get me in into action and be contributing. <laughs> by saying, right. "Go to the go to the bridge and get the wounded." So, d when you finally got to the bridge, you, you witnessed what was happening, right? Well, like I said, actually, I didn't. I didn't get out onto the bridge because this guy threw open the hatch, oh, had this guy on the stretcher, yeah. and said, "Take us below." Now, I don't remember how many um, runs I made up to the bridge. Um, we were attacked at two, and the probably lasted for about 25 minutes. Uh, at uh, 2:35, the torpedo boats came out. Um, so I was uh, down on the mess decks, and I remember uh, Captain McGonigal saying, "Prepare for." torpedo attack. And we all figured we could never, I mean, we'd sink if we took a torpedo. So um, one of the things that I remember is one of the guys on the mess decks that happened that wasn't badly wounded, it was like me running around trying to do various things, uh, was Catholic and he was on his knees on the deck uh, with his rosary beads praying. <laughs> so. Um, and uh, then uh, somebody was smart enough again, being green, I mean, you just don't know what to do. Yeah. 
And so somebody was smart enough that said, uh, throw yourself across the window. So I did. I laid across one of the tables. And next thing we knew, we took the torpedo hip, and it was like a giant was on one side of the ship and just lifted the ship up in the air, and then it slowly sank down in the water. Well, if we hadn't done that, all those guys would have just rolled off onto the floor. And so... And that was the, how many torpedo hits did the ship take? They, they fired five torpedoes at us. Luckily, we only took one hit. But it left a 40-foot hole in the starboard side. Yeah. Uh, so the torpedo, the torpedo boats came. They, they shot five torpedoes at you. Then they left? Well, no, then they backed off. And then, uh, well, I, I guess I didn't explain the air attack, really. First they came out with Mirage fighters, and uh, and then after that, uh, Mysterious bombers. And they messed around a lot of sorties to do the damage that they did, because uh, we were, um, we, when the, well, I, I shouldn't say after the fighters, probably after both sets of planes left, we ended up having over 820 rocket and cannon holes in the top side of the ship. And that doesn't count over 3,000 machine gun hits. As a matter of fact, one of the guys that was counting holes and hits later, he told me years later, he said, uh, we got to 3,000 and uh, the officer said, quit counting. That's enough. So nobody really knows how many machine gun hits there were. And then, but the second set of planes that came out were bombers, and they dropped napalm on us. So while we were running around trying to fight the fires from the napalm was when they uh, brought out the torpedo boats. And so we, uh, among other things, are, we had life raft racks. And among other things, those burnt from the napalm. And so... Uh, after the torpedo boats backed off, um, somebody said, prepare to abandon ship. And uh, I guess the guys that were topside threw the last inflatable life rafts that they could find that hadn't been burned in the water. And the, machine, uh, the torpedo boats came back and uh, fired holes in the, fired at the life rafts and sunk them. When did you realize these weren't Egyptian? Well, uh, oh, I don't think I did till after the fact. Yeah, a long time after the fact. And I, matter of fact, I don't think that any of us really knew till the attack was over. And uh, because, like I said, the, I, I think McGonigal did because I think the the planes were unmarked, but the uh, uh, torpedo boats I think were identified with the uh, Star David. So. I think by the time the torpedo boats came alongside, McGonagall knew. Yeah. You're a communication ship, technically, right? Um, I assume that uh, message was sent to for some kind of backup, some kind of uh, rescue. Well, that's another reason that everybody questions the attack uh, as not being delivered because they were jamming all our frequencies. Now, how would they know what frequencies to jam? And the only reason we got out, we, they, we couldn't use any of our transmitting antennas, but one of them hadn't been working, so they had never used it, the, this cruise. And uh, so uh, one of the, they'd taken it offline, and one of the, uh, one of our ETs, uh, ran some new long line uh, cables to that antenna and that was the only one we happened to get our distress call out on. As it turns out, the fellow who did that uh, just received a silver star a couple of years ago up in Visalia for, uh, for what he did. But, uh, and so, so what happens? I mean, he gets the so, distress call. Yeah, so we got the distress call. Well, Captain Tully was captain of the Saratoga. There were two carriers in the Sixth Fleet, the American and the Saratoga. Tully uh, had, after retiring from the Navy, he and Ruth lived in Carmel, and so Eve and I used to go up 
and take them out to dinner once a year. And uh, Joe would always look in his, sit in his living room and look at me with a confused look on his face and say, I never could figure out why my planes were recalled. So he told me, he said, I got your distress call between 205 and 209. He said, I had 16 planes, 4 tankers, and 12 fighter bombers in the air within 15 minutes of getting your distress call. So there's a chance they could have gotten to us before we took the torpedo hit. And the torpedo hit killed 25 of the 34 that died on board the Libby. Um, then his planes, he said, were recalled before they were out of sight by Admiral Geis, who was a wing admiral, the second ranking admiral under Admiral Martin on the America. And so, um, well, so. We didn't see any Americans till the next day, and um, later in the day, the American family came alongside, and we evacuated the badly wounded. Uh, and my boss, Dave Lewis, who was a lieutenant commander at the time, uh, uh, was one of the badly wounded. He was ten feet from the torpedo when it went off, and he said he looked to the side of him. He heard something, looked to the side of him, and this, saw this torpedo slide in on the other side of this bulkhead, the wall. And the wall shielded him from the blast, but all the paint on the wall ignited, and he, his body was flash burned. And then he was out, and uh, uh, my watch section supervisor, uh, Buddha Schnell, he saw him floating around down there and went down pulled him out of there, out of the torpedo, you know, as it was flooding. And um, so anyway, Dave was one of the ones we, we evacuated. And Dave, uh, in 97, I got the Navy Memorial in D.C. to put on a month-long display about what happened to us. So I wrote everybody off the ship, and I said, here's your chance to tell your story. And Dave sent me this letter telling this story. And I always say, well, I'll tell it the way he told me, <laughs> instead of what he put in the letter. But... So Dave said after they had to lance his eyes open because they were seared shut. And so after they uh, lanced his eyes open and cleaned him up a little bit, they said, Admiral Geis wants to see you in his cabin. So he went to Geis, up to Geis' cabin, and Geis said, um, I want the senior officer off the Liberty to know this story, but I don't want you to ever repeat it until I'm dead or gone because I've got a naval career to protect. So Dave did. He kept his mouth shut until after Geis died. And Dave said, um, Guy said, when Tully put up his planes, I'd radioed Washington, and he said the next thing I knew, Secretary of Defense McNamara came on and said, recall the planes. He looked at Dave and said, I can't, couldn't believe they were going to abandon you guys. So he said, the only thing I could think of is they uh, thought there were nuclear weapons on those planes. So he said, I told both the Saratoga and the America to bring up older planes from below that could only carry con conventional armament. An hour and a half after the attack started, he put up a set of planes from each carrier, radiated Washington again. He said, looked at Dave and said, and McNamara came on and said, recall the planes again. He said, I still couldn't believe they were going to abandon you guys, so I decided to push it. I asked him to authenticate his message. Well, in the Navy, that means, does your boss agree with the orders you're giving me? It's like going over his head. And he told Dave, he said, next thing I knew, <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson came on and said, recall the damn planes, I don't care who dies, I'm not going to embarrass my allies. So the White House left us for dead. So um, I kind of got out of sequence of the attack by telling that story. But uh, So for me, though, I uh, in the whole thing about the, our life rest being... So after the torpedo hit, I took the submergible pump forward, thinking it might be needed. Well, with a 40-foot hole in the side of the ship, you're not going to pump water out of it. So as I was getting up there, it was about the time they were getting ready to close the hatch, assuming they had gotten everybody out of there they could. So after that, I returned to the mess decks. Um, one of the main things that I remember happening on the mess decks was Doc Kiefer was going from patient to patient um, 
and he grabbed me and said, lay down here, and they stuck a tube in me and ran a tube across a stanchion to the, the guy he was going to operate on, and did sort of a live blood transfusion, and he opened the guy up and said, there's nothing they can do for him, his kidneys are shot out, and so he sewed him back up and went on to the next guy. Um, so th that's really, after I returned from the torpedoed spaces, that's probably the main thing that I remember. Well, what happened to you during this attack? Um, well, that was one of the reasons I ended up at the vet center was uh, survivor's guilt. I, uh, as I have said before, I got hurt worse playing high school football than I got hurt on the Liberty. I was, uh, I had some pretty dangerous injuries in football in high school, but uh, uh, so mainly I had cuts, burns, and bruises. Uh, most of them came from being bounced off the ladders carrying the wounded back from the bridge. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I wasn't hurt that bad that I really required that much attention. So I think it was probably the next morning, somewhere along the way, somebody said, report to sick bay. And I said, why? I'm not hurt that bad. And they said, it's an order, report to sick bay. So I went to sick bay and Corman inspected me and got out the logbook and logged in what he saw. The next thing I know, a few months later, I end up with a purple heart. So that plus the things I have explained are the are basically what I can remember <laughs> as far as my own. Uh, we just went to see uh, Little Saigon at the La Mirada Theater uh, a month or two ago, and I wrote the cast in the. Uh, artistic director of La Mirada email and told him how much I enjoyed the play and it took me back to the times of desperation and, and everything and, and I, but one of the statements I made in it was uh, I was always puzzled about living yeah. <laughs> so you know I walked around and well when we get to the next step it will become even clearer why I was so puzzled yeah. Don let me ask you um, after, after you, you know, first of all, you have some pictures here of what yeah, the ship the looked attack, like. Right. Um, after, after you've offloaded the, the dead and the wounded, um, the next thing you need to do is, is try to get this ship back into port, right? Well, yeah, well, we didn't really offload all of them, just the badly wounded that we oh, okay. helicopter okay. over to the America. We had the 25 guys down in the turn. The nine guys that were killed topside, we put, well, I guess, you know, I, like I said, I tend to... Uh, only remember bits and pieces. Right. I do remember putting the guys that were killed topside in body bags, and we kept put them in the refrigerator yeah. on the mess deck. Okay. But um, but then uh, s since there were no Americans or whatever, we just headed out to sea, and um, we sailed her a thousand miles for a week across the Mediterranean to put her dry dock in Malta. And we had uh, 25 of the 34 that died, died down where I worked, where the torpedo hit. So we couldn't get to them. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, my mother-in-law is in a memory care unit in Orange County, and we were over there a few weeks ago, and I saw this guy sitting there with a USS Papago hat on. I said, were you on the Papago? And he said, yeah. And I said, when? And he said, 57 and 58. Well, it turns out that the Papago is a seagoing tug. And so they sent the Papago out, and she met us about halfway to Malta and followed us in. Well, the seagoing tugs always carry divers. And so every once in a while, we would lose a body out the torpedo hole, and they'd have to put a diver in the water to retrieve it. So, um, uh, so you know, all that's going on while we're trying to make this thousand miles and we can only go five knots yeah, because uh, every time we went faster than that the ship started to shake so they were afraid she'd break apart if you know if we exceeded that speed 
And so uh, two of the duties I remember standing on the way to Malta was, uh, I guess they now use our ship to teach damage control in boot camp. And um, the walls, the bulkheads, next to the compartments where I worked, uh, they had to be shored up because they're internal walls and they couldn't stand a lot of sea pressure. So we used what was K-shoring. We took pieces of timber like this and a K to shore up the, the walls, the, the bulkheads. And so they took me up in this one passageway and said with a one battery light that <laughs> hardly put out any light at all, and they said, here, uh, we want you to watch this case and make sure it doesn't give way. And it's full of fuel oil and smells and everything. And I'm going, fine, I get to sit here and watch this. But if, this, if these walls give away, I think I'm done for. You're the first one to know, right? <laughs> and so then uh, the other uh, thing that they did was, uh, as a matter of fact, when I took one of my shipmates on the SS Lane Victory down in San Pedro, yeah, I took him down to the engine room, and then we went back to Shaft Alley, and they took me down to Shaft Alley, which is where the dry shaft runs from the engine room back to the screw of the propeller on the ship. And they said, and gave me a set of headphones, and they said, here, watch this, watch the dry shaft, and if the ship starts vibrating so bad that things start leaking, tell the bridge they need to abandon ship. And I thought, that may be fine, you might get off of here, but I think I'm going to be stuck down here. So that week, there, I know there were a lot of other things we did and everything, yeah. but those were probably the two things that sort of stand out in my mind. Did, did they send an escort for you guys? Well, that's what I, I said. That's the next called? next day, the first, what they did was, since they didn't send planes, they dispatched two destroyers immediately and the destroyers came alongside the next morning the USS Davis and the USS Massey and uh, matter of fact I have a set of pictures in that slideshow where the, you, I just took them as the two destroyers came, successively came closer and closer to us and um, so that was, have, I'm sorry do you have the website where people can see that uh, slideshow you know it's on the web but it's not on my website Okay. Uh, my website's not sophisticated enough. I, I, I haven't, to tell you the truth, I haven't spent the time trying to figure out how. But it is on the internet, yes. It, if you, you put in USS Liberty search on the internet, a lot of the things that will come up, a lot, sometimes they'll have my slideshow okay. on there. But, so, um, those two things uh, on two. the way... The two destroyers came up alongside. Yeah, the yeah, and so they they sort of escorted us for a while, and then, like I said, the the Papago met us about halfway to Malta and followed us, and uh, they tried to cover the torpedo hole with nets at one time, but it didn't work, and so um, so yeah, we had somebody with us all the way across the Mediterranean. And so when we got there and we put her in dry dock, they wanted those of us with the top secret crypto clearances to go down and clean up first because it was where we worked and all the classified equipment and stuff was down there. So um, that was the other thing that Papago was doing, doing is if they saw paperwork floating around, they would go over and run over it with their screws, you know, to try and chop it up as much as they could. Because the first ship we actually saw the following early the following morning was a Russian ship, oh. and uh, so anyway, so when we got there, they wanted those of us with the clearances to go down and clean up, and so I went down there, and uh, within the first 15, 20 minutes, I found an arm, and even though it had been soaked in salt water for a week, I could tell by the relative muscle structure it was a bodybuilder that it was his arm. And so after that, I, I was down there for two days, and I just blanked out the rest of those two days. I don't remember. Did they talk to you, Don, on the way back about uh, what to expect when you got back to port as far as being questioned? Uh... Well, again, being so green, yes, we had Captain Boston and Admiral Kidd came on board about halfway to Malta. And 
they were the two guys that were going to run the Court of Inquiry. A kid was actually in charge of it. Captain Boston was would be like the district attorney at a grand jury. He was responsible for bringing the facts before the court. And so, um, so there are a lot of stories that aren't mine. I mean, I have one guy that was in the deck crew that I know real well that lives in Colorado, and he said that uh, kid got a bunch of them together and took off his admiral's insignias off his collar and said, uh, I want you to tell me what went on in your own words. So they did. And Phil said, well, we got through. He put his admiral's insignias back on and said, now, I don't want you ever to say anything to anybody about this. He says, because if you do, you'll be court-martialed or worse. So, in my case, well, I'll get to that one when I was flown back to Norfolk, what, what they told me. But So, and then I wasn't called before the uh, court because I was so green with my job. I wasn't topside. You know, there wasn't much I could add that would be distinctive. Yeah. And I was such a low rank and everything. Um, so... Uh, like I said, though, uh, so we ba we basically bagged up the equipment and the people that were down there. And after the two days, I went out on Liberty one afternoon, and and as I said before, <laughs> I have no idea how I got back uh, back to the ship. I, I, the last thing I remember at seven o'clock in the evening, I was drinking cognac out of eight ounce tumblers. <laughs> so. I, I have no idea how I got back to the ship. But anyway, and then a, a, a few days after that, they flew, I don't know whether it was 5, 10, you know, a, a small group, of, a couple of different small groups of us, because they were only going to need a skeleton crew to get her. They were going to need all, us all the intelligence guys who were going to be doing our job. Yeah. So after they were going to patch the ship up, they weren't going to need everybody. So they flew a bunch of us out. And, and I was, I think I... Uh, we flew from Malta to Rota. We were in transit for a couple of days in Rota. And then they bussed us to Madrid, and we flew from Madrid to New York, and then from New York either to D.C. and, and Norfolk, or just straight to New York to Norfolk. I don't remember about the last part of it. When they got me in Norfolk, they gave me orders to go home on 30 days leave, and I was debriefed by an intelligence officer and they said, he said, uh, you've got the highest security clearance anybody can get in this country, go away, never talk about this to anybody, including your family. So for 18 and a half years I kept my mouth shut. So mom and dad didn't even know that this ever happened? I, well, I told, I told mom one time and she went around, ran around town telling everybody, don't ask Don anything, he can't talk. So, um, uh, so, like I said, I kept my mouth shut, and so I wasn't going to be able to deal with anything, Cyber Survivors Guild or anything. Anger over being abandoned and stuff, and so um, it was, uh, since we're here in Long Beach, it's close to this story. I, uh, well, I went, when I got out of the Navy, I went back to the University of Kansas and got a degree in, in business. I got out of, of uh, University of Kansas and was hired by Caterpillar Tractor Company at the corporate offices in Peoria, your hometown. And so uh, I uh, was there three years and I thought, boy, you know, if I stay here any longer in three years, I'm going to be relegated to the Midwest because all of them, all of them, even if I were to change to another company, all the construction machinery companies are in the Midwest. And so I... Uh, uh, I came out here one time at Christmas time because Cat always shuts down at Christmas time and, and uh, beat the streets until I finally found a job out in Orange County. I got interviewed by, they were a combination of headhunters and, uh, and consultants and they were consulting for this little toy company. Uh, it was called Cox Manufacturing. They made the little U-control airplanes yeah. that we used to fly on the end yeah. of strings. Yeah. 
the gas engines. And so um, I went to work there. Well, the guy I went to work for, I called being a kid because he was two years younger than I was. He had a Harvard MBA. He came from the Dillingham family, which owned most of the sugar cane in Hawaii. He was a rich kid. And so he, um, you know, he, uh, uh, he was bored with his life and decided to become a nest instructor. I don't know if you know what nest is, but it's a, it's a retreat type place up in central California where people go to think about themselves. <laughs> and so uh, he quit. Well, the, there was a sister company in Minnesota, so the guy that was president of it took over both companies, and he didn't want the company organized the way it was, so they said, here's a month and a half salary, so long. Well, if I'd have done a real terrible job, they wouldn't be giving me a month and a half salary, but that wasn't what was going on with me. I was going, boy, I screwed that up again, didn't I, just like on the Liberty. So it, to me, it was just another nail in my coffin that I couldn't talk about. And so uh, luckily, I ended up uh, going to work for Hughes Helicopters in Culver City and uh, worked there for five years. And uh, I wasn't happy with that company. And so then I knew somebody that had gone over to Hughes Aircraft in El Segundo. And so I ended up uh, getting hired at Hughes Aircraft and I uh, was there for 20 years and retired. Even I both have retired from there. And uh, so for 25 years, I commuted from Orange County down to 405, you know, to either El Segundo or Culver City. Well, in 1985, I uh, started losing my vision. I couldn't see the center stripe in the road anymore, and I went to an optometrist. And he said, you don't have an eye problem, but you have a physical problem. He said, you better go see a doctor. So the doctor came back in white as a sheet and said, um, I don't know why you're still alive. He said, you should have died a long time ago. He said, one of your major organs should have popped. He said, your blood pressure is 240 over 145. And he said, it's been that way for a long time. Did the, the damage to the eyes. Well, luckily, I was having strokes in the retina of my eyes instead of a heart in my brain where it would have killed me. So he put me on as heavy blood pressure medication as he could. And for a year and a half, he could only get it down to 140 to 180 over 100 to 140, which is still high. And uh, he was frustrated, and finally I was watching an old Simon & Simon detective show, and I found out about PTSD, so I called the VA hospital here in Long Beach, told them what I was looking for, and they said, well, we don't do that here, but the closest vet center to you is uh, five blocks north of Disneyland. Well, within a month of going and being able to talk about what happened to us, both blood pressure drop numbers dropped 30 points, no change in medication, just from not keeping everything all bottled up inside. So then I was there for three years, uh, going once a week at night for group therapy, and, uh, and uh, it, was, it took a long time to, to even just get some of this stuff uncovered. And uh, I, uh, one night in group, one of the uh, guys in my group that had been a Marine in Vietnam looked at me and said, you guys got screwed as bad, if not worse, than anybody I ever saw in Vietnam. He said, you've got every right to be as angry as you can be, but he says, it's your anger. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. Uh, crap, I have to own this too. <laughs> so it took me four and a half years before I knew, could figure out the answer to that question. I wasn't going to write Congress. I've got a college degree. I know they're not going to do anything about it. So uh, after four and a half years, I finally decided, you know what, I'm going to unload my anger. I'm going to write, write them. And if they can sleep, if they can go to bed at night and sleep with themselves after knowing what happened to us, then more power to them. But at least uh, I'm going to give my anger to them. I'm tired of it. It's killing me. And so I wrote every California and Kansas congressman and senator, and they all passed the buck back to Rohrbacher, my local councilman, and he asked me to come in and talk to him. And he said, uh, he says, uh, I've read everything you've written. It was, I read a three-page letter with 30 pages of documentation. And 
he said, I've read everything you've written, all the material you sent me. He says, there's no way I believe this was a mistake on the part of the Israelis. But he said, i got to tell you, Congress won't touch us until after there's peace in the Middle East. Well, it's not going to be in my lifetime. But, so that's five years just to try and deal with that one emotion. And then I had to deal with the Survivor's Guild. And um, so, um, but one of the stories after I finally broke down physically, I went into a year and a half of deep depression. And luckily I managed to keep my job at Hughes. And um, I was driving home on the 405 San Diego Freeway here in Long Beach where all those overpasses are, the, one, the ones where you can get off and get back on the freeway and all that. And uh, I looked at those pylons and I thought, you know, if I just floor this car and drive into these pylons, I could end all this emotional pain I'm in. Now, as I've said before, I don't really consider that an active thought of suicide exactly because that's a dumb way to do it. You're just going to end up with a bunch of broken bones in a hospital. You're not going to die if you really want to. If you really want to do it, you're either going to put a gun to your head or take a big dose of pills or something. But, uh, but I, I, I was very depressed, and um, um, I told uh, one of our favorite movies is uh, Return to Me, and when. Uh, after the guy loses his wife in the car wreck, he ends up on the floor sobbing. And I told Eva one time, I said, well, that's how I lived for a year and a half. I'd come home, eat dinner, drink a little wine, stare at the ceiling. Yeah. And, uh, and the vet center was the only thing that helped change all that. So well, that's good. And, uh, so show us your, the pictures that you have here. Yeah, okay, well. I don't know how well it can be seen, but this is the Liberty. This is after after we took the torpedo. You're not going to be able to tell, but we had a, a, a more than a 10 degree list from the torpedo. We were leaning. This picture was in Life magazine. It shows many of the 820 rocket and cannon holes topside. Okay. This is the top of one of the life raft racks where it attaches to the bulkhead and those those rafts all were burdened by napalm. This is all charred from the napalm fires. Then this is when we got to Malta. This is the tip of the torpedo hole. We're still in the water. Here we have put the ship in dry dock and the timbers holding the ship up. This is that tip. This is the water line. This is all underwater, all torpedo hole, and there's a white hat there. Yeah, it can be seen. That's one of my shipmates standing there. Gives us perspective how big the hole was. That was me when I was 21, with two of the uh, 820 rocket and cannon holes. Um, one of the things the uh, Israelis always tried to claim was they came out because they were uh, trying to find the ship that was shelling the shore the day before. And um, they got out there and found an old vintage World War II cargo ship with 450 caliber machine guns, as I said in my angry letter to Congress. Even a Cub Scout can tell you can't shell the shore 13 miles away with a 50 caliber machine gun. But they all, then they tried to say, well, we mistook her for the El Gazir. Well, that's almost even worse because he, he, these pictures aren't that good, but this is us, and this is the El Kazir, and the El, you can see the numbers at least. The El Kazir's a quarter of the displacement of our ship. Well, not only that, but tell me, doesn't the uh, Navy ship fly flags? Yeah, we had the flags flying. We had le letters on the aft end of the ship that said Liberty, and on the front end of the ship on both sides it said uh, GTR-5. Our actual designation is AGTR-5, which stands for Auxiliary Technical Research Ship. And um, so, uh, but, and that's what I mean, there's a, a many, uh, I mean, in the El Kazir um, was a World War One 
my understanding is it was a World War One ship built in by England, uh, then was owned by Egypt at the time, and uh, it was a horse carrier. And uh, not only was it only a quarter of the displacement, but they said they came. They said they thought they had us on radar doing 30 knots. Well, our top speed was 18 knots. And what's worse is then they said they mistook us for the El Kazir, and the El Kazir's top speed was 12 knots. So, I mean, it, it, it's, they're pretty lame excuses. Uh, and on the top part of this write-up, there's a lot of things that are one-liners that um, I'm not sure I can even remember them all, but um, besides the El Kazir thing, uh, the uh, Captain McGonigal was given the Medal of Honor. That's always given by the President of the White House. He got his Medal of Honor in the Washington Naval Shipyard from the Secretary of the Navy. I even have a memo out of the LBJ Library in Texas written by one of his staff members, his name was Jim Cross, that state, it, well, when our presidential unit citation and Bill's Medal of Honor citation were sent to the White House for signature, this Jim Cross wrote a memo attached to it to Johnson saying, we recommend you approve this and return it to the Navy for presentation so it will be kept out of the public media. So, um, and uh, then probably the thing that disturbed me the most was I spent those two days down there bagging up what was left of the 25 guys. And because some of them, all, that, all it was was body parts, we have a grave in Arlington National Cemetery that we call our mass grave and we hold a service there every June 8th. And uh, when they first put up the headstone, they wouldn't even put the name of our ship on it. It said, died in the Eastern Mediterranean, like they died in some taxi cab accident in Beirut. It wasn't until almost 15 years later that people raised enough hell to get it changed and now it says, killed USS Liberty. Still doesn't say anything about the Israelis, but at least it's a little more accurate. So, um, there is, you know, just... Uh, Matter of fact, the El Kazir story, I even found out later on the internet that the Mossad knew that the El Kazir wasn't seaworthy. It was in dry dock in Alexandria, Egypt at the time. Of course, they would say, well, you know, they may have done it, but the Navy and the Air Force didn't know it. Uh, so, just uh, a, a lot of things that they had. A lot of time has been spent to keep this covered up and out of the media. And Can you tell me the story you told me um, about uh, you and Eva going out to dinner and running into uh, a gentleman that had noticed, uh, I think it was your hat yeah. or your shirt on? No, it's his shirt. And uh, we went to Ruth Chris's in San Diego down on the harbor because our son, the oldest son, always gives us a gift certificate every year for Christmas. And we went in and I was talking to the guy that was seeing us because he had said that his father just retired from North Island Naval Station down in San Diego. And between talking about the Liberty and him looking at my shirt, Eva saw him and noticed how nervous he was, you know, and everything. Well, finally he leans over to me and says, were you on the Liberty? And I said, yeah. And he said, um, I wanted to meet somebody off of that sh ship for years. He said, I'm getting a advanced degree in military history and I would like to write a paper about the Liberty. So it turns out that um, we talked and they got through, they left. We had ordered our dinner and uh, finally I asked for the bill and the waitress comes and looks at me and says, did you know those people that were sitting here before? And I said, well, not before tonight. She says, well, they just gave us $100 towards your dinner. <laughs> well, it turns out he's a sergeant in the, uh, over the motor officers in Inglewood Police Department. So he, he invited me up to address his, his group of motor officers. So, yeah. so that was nice. But um, um, What about the Israeli officer in New Mexico? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's all part of this, what I was talking about, yeah. cover-up stuff. Uh, well, and this. This is a pamphlet. Admiral Moore was always... Well, Admiral Moore, two things about Admiral Moore. He was twice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Nixon era. And he is the only admiral in the U.S. Navy to ever command both the Pacific and the Atlantic Fleet. And he, um, he held this commission, which has all these findings. And, I mean, it was like shoving it right in the face of Congress because they held this commission on Capitol Hill. <laughs> and yeah. still nothing has come of it. And the people that the commission was made up of was Thomas Moore, who, by the way, if you've ever heard of the F-14 Tomcat that the Navy flies, it was named after Thomas Moore. And General Ray Davis, uh, who uh, was former assistant commandant of the Marine Corps, and then uh, Rear Admiral Merlin Starring, who lives out in Palm Desert area now, and he uh, he was head of the JAG for like four years, I think, back in the 80s or something like that. He was McCain's, Admiral McCain was in charge of the European theater oh. from, from a Navy standpoint. And so all this was being funneled through Admiral McCain's office. And so Starring was a captain at that time. He said he was McCain's legal counsel. So he said, they brought the Court of Inquiry papers back to him one afternoon and said, here, review these, uh, McCain wants you, you to sign off on them. Because uh, even I had invited him to come to our 2002 Liberty Reunion that we put together in, in Pensacola in 2002. And so, <clears throat> and Starring was telling us, he says, uh, so I started reviewing the papers, and about midnight I went home and got a little sleep, and about 4 in the morning I came back in and started working on them again. And he said and later in the morning, um, uh, they came down and said, have you signed off on these papers? And Starring said, no. He says, uh, there are findings that I can't see are supported by the facts in this court of inquiry. So they came back a little later and picked up all the papers and said, McCain said he doesn't need your signature and walked off with him. And Captain Boston, as I said, who was sort of like the DA at the court of inquiry in Malta in early 2000, came, finally came out of his shell and had had enough of it and said he had been, he and Kidd had been ordered by President Johnson to keep their mouth shut. And so he said, uh, one of the things he said was, when Kidd and I flew on board the Liberty, he said, we took one look around and went, boy, the Israelis not only wanted to sink this, they intended to kill everybody on this ship. And um, so he said, the papers <clears throat> that went back to Washington, the papers that were released, <clears throat> by our government were not the same papers. They had been altered from the papers that he sent back to Washington. And so, um, but anyway, so Moore, back to what, your question, Moore uh, had always said that the Johnson administration had told the Israelis we would support them as long as what they did was defensive in nature. And the day after they tried to sink us is when they attacked Syria and took all of Golan Heights land, which wasn't defensive. Now, to go along with Moore's supposition that they didn't want us to find out what their plans were, even I were coming back from my mother's house in Kansas in, uh, I think, 2004, and we stayed in Taos, New Mexico in the Best Western, and I was walking down the hall with a T-shirt that we have, and she saw this guy looking at it and said, are you interested in that church? And I turned around and looked at him and I said, he said, uh, I got to tell you, I was an officer in the Israeli army in 1967 when you guys were attacked. And he, I was so impressed he had guts enough to say anything to my face for all he knew, I might tear his throat out. 
And uh, so I said, well, I've got a slideshow that I've done, but I always carry a hard copy in the car. And I said, um, I'll go to the car and get the slideshow, and we'll meet you and your wife in the bar. So I got the bar, and I went through this notebook, the, the slideshow with him, and when I got through, he said, uh, I never could understand why the uh, American government spent so much time covering this up, he said, because he said when the Six-Day War was over, Moshe Dayan, who was in charge of all the Israeli military, uh, briefed all the officer cadre as an outtake to the war, and when he came to the Liberty, he didn't make any bones about it. He said, we tried to take out the Liberty because we didn't want him to find out what our plans were. So everybody below, anybody that knows much about it at all knows what reality really is and that it wasn't a mistake. But you're never going to get an active person in government. All the people that are in government, um, Richard Helms, when he, he finally got out and wrote his book, uh, said in there that it was, you know, he, it, it wasn't a mistake. Um, you know, nobody's going to speak to the issue as long as they're still in government. And um, uh, the guys who are going to play in politics, like Johnson, Johnson's book of memoirs uh, has, uh, I think, three paragraphs about us in there. And he doesn't lie. What he does is he quotes the New York Times and what the New York Times had in it the day after we were attacked, which says there were 10 dead and a few wounded, which is a long way from 34 dead and 174 wounded, which is 70% of our crew. So he leaves the reader of his book with a total misconception of what reality is, but he doesn't really lie about it. So, um, so tell me, Don, you, when you get out, they, you said they sent you home for 30 days. Right. Um, after your thir for, first of all, when you go home, you're faced with this burden of not being able to talk about it. Were you able to do that? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I kept my mouth shut. Kept your mouth shut. Yeah. Well, how did you deal with pen keeping this all pent up? Well, I made it like it was a bad B movie, and that it didn't really happen to me. And uh, so consequently, I really had no life, because I couldn't own what my life had been. Did your did your family, could they tell a difference in, in the way your Yeah, well, I think so, yeah. And then, of course, I was still in the Navy. I still had three years left to go, right. so, uh, or a little less maybe, but... Uh, so I, I, you know, it wasn't like I was around home either. Yeah. You know, in, in Kansas, and uh, so I got stationed at Naval Communications Station, Hawaii, and for the next two and a three quarters of a year or whatever. And uh, and uh, while I was there, um, I. Um, while I was there, the Pueblo happened, and that was just another nail in my coffin because I couldn't talk to anybody about the Pueblo because I couldn't even talk to anybody about me in the Liberty. Pueblo, Pueblo was uh, captured by the North Koreans, and while, while there was not hardly any loss of life, uh, they spent 11 months in captivity. And the North Koreans are pretty brutal people. <laughs> and a matter of fact, I have one guy that we have lunch with uh, every th uh, three times a year because I belong to the Southern California chapter of the Naval Cryptologic Veterans Association. It's all us ex spooks from the Navy. And uh, and we meet down in San Diego, and Jim, uh, his name's Jim Kill, and he was a chief on the, Liber uh, on the Pueblo when they were captured. So he, you know, he spent... 11 months as guest of the North Koreans, <laughs> and uh, and so I, I uh, and then and then after that, another few months after the Liberty, uh, I, most people don't remember this one, but the there was another side of the Navy guys that did what I did. They were air guys. And to a great degree, the plane they flew was called the EC-121. It was the old Constellation. 
a very old art aircraft, <clears throat> and um, and some of the missions in, in Vietnam, they would fly from Japan over to Vietnam, and their their uh, one of the, one of their jobs was to fly over. The Vietnamese used SAM missiles, and they were portable, so they moved them every day. So conventional intelligence wasn't going to do a lot for you. So they flew these EC-121s over and, and would get the SAMs to light up on them and lock onto them. And then with the electronic gear they had on board, they could pinpoint right where they were and then call air strikes in them. And so these guys had just flown their mission and they were on their way back to Japan and they got, they were in international airspace, but they got close enough to North Korea and the North Koreans shot them down and all 31 guys did. And um, so uh, most people don't hear about that because, you know, the Navy would just, send, uh, especially NSA and our, our whole group of people that I was in, would just did not have any publicity about yeah. what these kinds of things. But, but anyway, so all these happened while I was in Hawaii. And so it just drove me further in the ground. So. Now, did you get married? While you were in Hawaii, or no, I I got married right before I uh, reported to the Liberty. As I said, I got out of uh, CT school in early March, got married in the middle of March, reported to the ship late March, okay. and went to sea and everything. I came back, and then um, um, we spent a life of running away from ourselves and drifting apart. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, in 87, about the time all my breakdown was happening, as a matter of fact, we had gone to marriage counseling. That's part of what brought all this stuff, broke the dam loose, was because I went, it, this guy that we went to the marriage counseling and run the Minnesota whatever psychological test that they use that's supposed to be really good. and. And I went in the next week to talk to him, and he said, uh, he'd graphed everything on a graph, and he said, I want you to look at this graph. And he says, and, and my uh, self-esteem, he said, was right on the x-axis. It didn't exist. So, um, and then he says, uh, he, he asked me, he says, so what are you denying? Well, obviously, <laughs> the liberty. <laughs> and so he... Uh, uh, and, and of course, being a good old Kansas farm boy, you say I'm in denial, that means I'm lying. And so all it did was crank up my anger <laughs> till, till the damn family broke loose. And, uh, and that was all what just preceded. As a matter of fact, right after that second session where he confronted me with that was when I was driving through Long Beach here on the way home from work. And that's when the Liberty family came back to me. I drove off the side of the freeway and sat there and cried for 10 minutes before I finally realized I was thinking about the Liberty. Because that, before that, I just shut it out of my life. It didn't exist. So, Did you have any children from your first wife? No. No? No, I went from, from uh, no children to 12 grandchildren. <laughs> Eva's had her own form of PTSD. Her first husband died on her when she was 34 of cancer. She had four kids, and he left her with four kids to raise by herself. And so, um, so between the two of us, I guess we had plenty to commiserate about <laughs> abandonment and everything else. So, but um, so uh, I. Um, Sorry, that's all right. I just have a few more questions yeah. for you, Don. Um, you told me earlier that uh, you made friends that you know when you're in the service. Do you still keep in contact with any of those guys? We have a reunion, a Liberty reunion. About well, originally it was set up. We we're going to have two reunions every five years. Oh, good. Yeah, sometimes we've actually had what they call a mini reunion in between, so there's been something going on, but guys can't make them all. Yeah. And so, so, uh, but. Uh, any any time we have the reunion back in D.C., that's another one of the very important stories. Uh, we always have, have a service, like I said, 
uh, at the grave site, at her mass grave site. And McGonigal, like the rest of us, was ordered not to talk about it, and he was high ranking. I mean, you know, he retired a captain. And he, um, a lot of the guys off the ship would be angry at him because he never spoke out about it, you know, felt like he kind of abandoned us too, you know, but he, just like Captain Boston and Admiral Kidd, they, they were all ordered by the top of our government never to talk about it. So, Bill, none of us knew it at the time, Bill had cancer. And at our 1997 reunion, he um, made a speech out at our mass grave, and he grabbed, and I'd, I'd seen him do, do this other places where he would address, say, the Medal of Honor Society or whatever. He grabbed his, uh, Medal of Honor, and would say, I wear this for my whole crew. He says, I was so inspired that they were not giving up their need to save their ship. He said that I couldn't, I had to stay at my post for 17 hours. He was wounded. And uh, what I always said was, it's so funny because that's uh, one of the main things about it. the whole situation for me is, is teamwork, which I'll go into after I finish telling this. Uh, we were all running around going, as long as the old man's on the bridge, we still have a chance to survive this. So it was like them giving, him giving us credit, and we were all saying, you know, he's the guy leading the show, and, you know, he's the strong one, you know. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, it really is a matter of teamwork. And so when people think, it's one thing that, that, that people have gotten medals oftentimes, get irritated about. You'll, you'll hear people say, well, he won his medal in such and such. You don't win a medal. <laughs> You're given a medal. And uh, it's not a competition. And so it wasn't about getting medals. It was about teamwork and, and keeping our ship afloat. And uh, as I've said before, just like uh, working at Hughes, uh, we put up communication satellites and you know, whether it's uh, that or the Liberty or whatever. And, I, and I, I've said this before. When I was a kid, you, we, we started out with my childhood. When I was a kid, I was really big in the track. And the re one of the reasons was because I always said, if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. I can't blame it on anybody else. But it all belongs to me. And I have realized later in life that that's great. you have to own what you've done and live with it. But doing something bigger than just what you are, being a part of a team, whether it's putting satellites in the sky or keeping the liberty from sinking, you know, is something that can never be replaced with how good I am. And so, do you um, belong to any of the uh, organiza military organizations, VFW, American Legion? Yes and no. <laughs> okay. I am not active in uh, either one of them, and I really have, think I should become active in the VFW. And the reason I say that is because I wouldn't join the Legion, because both those groups originally wanted to shy away from us, too, because... Uh, they get dumped on by uh, Jewish war veterans, I mean, you know, uh, whatever. So, and in, God, I can't even remember what year it was, but uh, Paul Finley was a downstate congressman in Illinois, and he uh, was uh, basically ousted by APEC. Uh, if he, he didn't root hard enough for Israel and said some critical things, and they went after him. And as one one guy in a radio, in, a guy that was a radio interviewer, I remember him saying, "My God, when they got through with him, even his own mother wouldn't have voted for him." But um, 
Paul wrote uh, three books, and, and he's got something in, in each book about us. Well, uh, this post in Zimmerman, Minnesota, which is a little town that's on the northwest corner of Minneapolis, one of their World War II vets uh, got a hold, was reading Finley's book and read about the Liberty, so he came to the post meeting one time and he said, we ought to do something for these guys. So they, these guys traveled to 42 posts in Minnesota in one year telling the story of the Liberty. So I was so impressed with them <laughs> that I joined their American Legion group, so I'm still on their role uh, to support them for what they did for us. Uh, the BFW, I'm a member at large. I've never really gotten, yeah. you know. Although I did have a nice interview when Mother was failing in November of 2004, I called up the editor of the BFW magazine because their headquarters is in Kansas City, which is about 100 miles where I, from where I grew up. And so he said, well, yeah, come down. I'd like to talk to you. So I had a two-hour meeting with him in Kansas City at the VFW headquarters. So, uh, and he, he has done some nice articles about us in the magazine and stuff, and so uh, I, uh, so yes, I, I am a member, but I'm not what you'd call right, in, a, in a local member. post, yeah. you know, really yeah. being actively involved. So. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, also, I wanted to ask you, um, how, how do you think your wartime experiences have affected your life? <laughs> and you've basically kind of already covered that. Yeah. Um, so what about life lessons learned from being in the military? Well, like I said, the one thing I think, you know, it's, it's funny. Her dad, when I started dating Eva, all her and her two brothers knew was that he was in the Army in the 40s. When I went down there and I started grumbling about the liberty and stuff, then he started telling me, he says, well, you know, I was a medic in Germany in World War II. So that's the first time they knew anything about his service. And then a few years before he died, we were down there, and he looked at us and said, uh, I think I have a bronze star out in the garage someplace. And uh, Ray, her stepdad, uh, Odd similarities. Ray married her mother when her mother was 50 years old. Her mother had four kids. Eve and I got married when she was 50 years old. Eve had four kids. And Ray, Ray is from Kansas, and I'm from Kansas. Ray's a combat veteran. He was in the 4th Marine Division. Matter of fact, the last time when I came to talk to you, that guy that was in the lobby, yeah, had, yeah. his hat, yeah, I he know. had the red marine hat on with a diamond with four in it. I said, were, are you in the, were you in the 4th Marines? He says, yeah. I says, were you on Iwo Jima? He says, no, but I was on Tinian and Saipan. Yeah. And um, so Ray was on uh, Iwo Jima, Tinian, and Saipan. And he never talked about it. He wouldn't even join any of the organizations, Legion, VFW, or anything. On the other hand, so there's a similarity on the one hand, but they chose not to talk about it. I was ordered not to talk about it, and it it, it, it did damage to me. Uh, it kept me from growing through any of the emotional things I needed to grow through, including my childhood issues yeah. that I, I could never get around to. We dated for six years, and uh, one time when the subject of marriage came up, I said, you know, I've got childhood issue, i got other things i got to work through before you and I can ever think about marriage. I'm upset because I, it's just, it, it's not going to work if I don't. Okay. And so, um, so it's had a tremendous impact. Partly the combat, but an awful lot of it how we've been treated politically and the fact that nobody, and I mean, I make it a, a, a phony story so I don't have to deal with it and own it and everything. And then the rest of the country makes it a funny story by trying to accept an excuse that nobody in their right mind would accept, unless you're just a fanatic Israeli supporter. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it really screwed me up. <laughs>
Don, the last thing I have for you is, is not really a question. It's, I, I want to give you a chance to make a final statement. Um, it could be on anything you want it to be. It could be something that we haven't talked about. It could be um, anything that you wish. Well, I think I hit on one of the most important things, and that is the teamwork idea. Um, so I guess I really don't need to probably say a whole lot more about that. If that's one of the things. The other thing is that I am... I, I read a lot of things people say no one was ever punished, none of the Israelis were ever court-martialed or punished or whatever. Well, that isn't my objective. When I gave up my anger to Congress, you know, what I want is our, the real side of the story of what really happened put into history. That's That and the teamwork idea are probably the two biggest things for me. Um, as uh, James Scott in the one book that I gave you, Attack on the Liberty, said at the end, he took his thought. You asked me about that day, that's funny. The day we were attacked, his dad, John, had the four to eight watch in the morning. So he was asked what kind of day it was, and he says, it started out to be a great day. First of all, it was my birthday. And he said, and second of all, I got to see the sun come up in the Mediterranean. And he said, it was a good day till late morning. <laughs> and um, he took, so James took John to Tel Aviv with him when he was doing research for the book. And he ran across a retired Israeli Air Force general who uh, happened to be one of the pilots that attacked us. So he called the guy up and he said, uh, he said, I'd like to come out and interview you. And the guy says, no, no, I'm not going to be interviewed. He says, but I would like you to come out to the house for coffee. So James got in the cab, he said, and went out to, out to that, this guy's house. And he said, uh, he got inside and he was talking about John being back in the hotel. And the guy says, you mean your dad's here with you? And he said, yeah. He says, well, why didn't you bring him along? He says, well, I thought it might be kind of uncomfortable for you. And he said, um, uh, no, no, I want to meet your dad. So he called John up, and John got in the cab and came out, and James said, Dad no sooner walked in the house, and this guy apologized for attacking us. So you'll never, we'll never be able to change what happened. And that, that's not the issue, but it, it's, it gnaws at me to have this thing misconstrued, and that's, and that's been part of I kept my mouth shut. Other people wanted to manipulate the history part of it. And so that that's, like I said, that's basically my objective. Uh, that and trying to tell kids, you know, how important teamwork is. And uh, so I think that's, those are the two main things. Um, other than the fact that um, I have a wonderful wife. And what's her name? Eva. Eva, and how long have you guys been together? We got married in 93, and we dated for six years before that. Good. So. Good. Well, Don, on behalf of the Greater Long Beach chapter of the American Red Cross. Uh, I, I don't care, but there's one. Oh, please. One, one, if you wanted to put any more of this stuff on camera, I have that slideshow in my car. Oh. In a notebook form, so that's up to you. The front cover of this is Captain McGonagall. Um, with his Medal of Honor. Uh, by the way, uh, I have our group in the Veterans Day Parade in Palm Springs every year. That's where McGonigal retired. And actually, he grew up out there. He graduated from Coachella Valley High School at the other end of the valley. So he's a local fellow. Uh, and so, I, as I said, I won't, the story's been told. I don't really dwell on... Oh my, on the word charts. Um, this was on the way to Abidjan in the Atlantic. I was, as I said, I was an E3 at that time, a seaman, and about as green as they come, and that's me in the Atlantic. Um, 
This is when we hit Road to Spain to pick up people on the way into the Mediterranean. And uh, this is our executive arm, our officer, Phil Arms, Philip Armstrong. That's him, too. And this is one of my CT chiefs, uh, Smith. They died during the attack. Uh, Chief Smith has a barracks named after him in Pensacola at the school. This is uh, Captain McGonigal, uh, Armstrong, and um, our engineering officer, Lieutenant Golden, all sunbathing in the morning before we were attacked. This is one of the, I don't even think I mentioned this, this is one of the 13 reconnaissance missions the Israelis ran on us in the morning. They even admit they had us identified as a naval intelligence ship at 6 o'clock in the morning, but then they say the marker was taken off the board at shift change at 8 o'clock because it was old information. This, which probably you can't see, is the first attack aircraft coming in. This is, this is me with the holes. This is um, Captain McGonigal with a rocket hole, uh, Ensign Dave Lucas, who was on the bridge most of the time with McGonigal. Uh, these, another two rocket holes, uh, another CT friend of mine, he lives in Missouri. He's, uh, this is uh, some more of the holes. Uh, now we get into, well, so is this. This is where our whale boat hung. It burnt. You can see all these. This is the back of the bridge. All these rocket holes up here. Um, more there. This is the front bridge looking aft. It's just peppered with machine gun fire. Uh, this is that one picture I showed you before. It's a little bigger. More damage. Captain McGonigal sitting in his cabin with a rocket hole. This is looking out a rocket hole out of Lieutenant Golden's cabin. This is the main mast. It had a rocket hole. I said about them not only jamming all of our frequencies, but you can see these are our antenna mounts, and they're always full of hole. The interesting thing about this picture right here is you see that hatch, the metal is coming out. The rocket went in the other side of the ship, traveled clear through the ship, and came out this hatch on the other side. And this is very telltale. This is our starboard forward gun mount. And you can see what's left of the man who tried to man it. His blood is running down this. Uh, blood's running down the wall. And by the way, there is a, uh, at the Navy School in National City, there is a building named after him. His name's Alexander Thompson. And this is that same gun man. It's up here looking into it. Uh, that's some more of Thompson's blood there, but uh, we're sailing the next day right alongside of is the USS Davis. To give you an idea of how undermanned we were, this is one of our 50 caliber machine guns. And this gun right here is what the USS Davis had for an anti-aircraft gun, which is a lot larger gun than we, what we had. So then, uh, this is all napalm issue. But as I said, this is where, this is the life raft rack, the rack that burnt, along with the life rafts. This is where it attaches, and the gun mount's right above it. Um, again, this is all burnt from napalm. This is where we had the badly wounded on the mess decks. And there.
This was a torpedo boat circling the ship. It's right there. And, uh, I mentioned the K shoring. This is this is what K shoring looks like. And this is John Scott, who happens to be James' father. This is the pictures I talked about. The next day, the Davis and the Massey just coming closer and closer. Here's a five-inch gun on the Davis, <laughs> which is much larger than anything we had. Uh, these are pictures taken of us from the other ships the next day. This is uh, air, the airlift from us to the America. This is lifting off of ours, coming to the America. These are the guys on board. Uh, I told the story about Dave Lewis having his eyes lanced open. This is Dave. These guys are all on the America. They felt, held a service for us the following day. That's what these Marines are doing. Again, the list from a camera standpoint, the torpedo hole, we had divers that went in first into the torpedo hole, all pictures of the torpedo hole, this is the one I showed before. This is the cleanup that I talked about, as a matter of fact, some people have said that they think that's a picture of me. Uh, you can see how mangled the metal was. The torpedo just <laughs> pretty much obliterated everything. We were taking a break here. And that's me after working the cleanup crew. Here they were bringing caskets on board to put the dead in. These guys are in body bags. Patched her up, sailed her back to the U.S. Interesting photo about this is you ask about the flag. Here's our steaming colors, which is three a three by five flag. And after we, I think three by five or five by seven, but after it was shot down in the middle of the attack, our signalman put up a seven by thirteen foot flag, which is a huge flag. No mistake in that one, right? Yeah. This is when they got back to Little Creek, which is just south of Norfolk, when they were bringing her into port. And this is the only word chart that's really important. The 34 guys that died. Yeah, hold, on, hold that right there. Let me get a copy. We'll get a picture of that. At the, at, at the, you don't need to have this, okay, but at, well, at the end I was, uh, oh, okay. Well, that's why, um, so did you want to add anything else to this? No, that's uh, okay. Okay, then in, uh, uh, for the American, Greater Long Beach Chapter of the American Red Cross, in conjunction with the Library of Congress and the American Folk Life Center, um, I want to thank you again for your time and service to your country, and I want to let you know that the interview is now over. Thank you. Thanks, Don.